Good evening, everybody. I'm Tobin Arthur, the founder of Angel and D. Very pleased to have you joining us tonight for the first pitch club of the fall. And we've got three great startups for you tonight. And so we're really excited to bring them to you. If you haven't introduced yourself in chat, you should have access to the chat function. Please introduce yourself, give your name, maybe where you're based and your professional role. If you're a physician, maybe your specialty, uh, that would be terrific. I also want to take a second and thank our platinum sponsors tonight, both Parcel Path and Holland Biosciences. Both were sponsors of the inaugural edition of MD Next magazine. Hopefully all of you have seen that magazine. It's had great reviews. We're really excited about that. And we've got the next edition in the works. It will be out just before Thanksgiving. But we do want to thank uh, both Parcel Path and Holland Bioscience. They're in the magazine. We'll have links to their websites. You can learn more about these really innovative companies uh, in the email, the follow-up email tomorrow. So without further ado, we like to keep things moving quickly. I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Katie Richardson. Welcome. Thank you, Tobin. Exciting to be back for Pitch Club. Super excited to be back. And as Tobin mentioned, we have three great startups tonight. We, are, we have one live presenter and um, two presentations that have been videotaped, but all of the Q&A will be live tonight. We would love for you to put any questions in the Q&A, um, which you can find on your lower toolbar, and we'll be taking questions after each pitch. We also are gonna have some polls as we move through the evening because uh, these CEOs and founders really want your feedback on their company. Um, they actually have had a hand in creating some of the questions for our polls tonight. So please, um, when we have an opportunity, we would love your feedback on how everyone is doing. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first presenter, and that is Kathy Skinner, and she is the co-founder and CEO of NextGen Port. Good evening. My name is Kathy Skinner, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of NextGen Port, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. Care for patients in the home has accelerated, and oncology is no exception. Hospital in the home has the potential for organizations to manage costs by addressing capitation associated with care and shifting to payment based on outcomes. While hospital at home is growing, physicians insist upon a high quality of care. Imagine a hospital at home model where there's real-time monitoring of blood cell counts and cardiac output. Simple measures such as heart rate and oxygen level are insufficient, especially when we think of at-risk cancer patients. What if we could see early signs of adverse events before patients have symptoms? That would be the difference between hospitalization or not, or life or death. Current methods of monitoring cancer patients at home are missing critical health information, and we've created a better way. NextGen Port is the first of its kind implanted smart port that detects early signs of infection by measuring changes in blood cell counts, heart function, and vitals for real-time monitoring for patients at home. We add microelectronics to the inside of the port. We measure blood cells as they flow past our optical system in vivo, much like flow cytometry measures blood cells in the lab. The data is transmitted to the cloud and critical information is passed on to physicians who then can communicate with patients. Our software uses machine learning to count cells based on their known size and composition. Our data package provides information on changes in red blood cells, white blood cells, and cardiac in output as an early warning for adverse events. We're in a second year of a collaboration agreement with Mayo Clinic, where we meet regularly with a leading oncologist to understand how this novel data would impact patient care. We're in a partnership with Lucem Health. Lucem uses AI to create a point of care solution. Through this partnership, we gain access to an AI hub for our unique data set to land. Let's go deeper into the science. Our technology uses microelectronics with a rechargeable power source to the body of the port and threads a fiber optic bundle through the wall of the catheter. Using multispectral imaging, we illuminate the field and capture images of the blood cells as they flow past fiber optic bundles at the end of the catheter to see the red blood cells and white blood cell images. Our proprietary technology increases the image magnification by 10X with a single lens component. The images are processed by a trained machine learning algorithm 
that counts the cells based on their known size and composition. The real-time longitudinal data is analyzed and we share the findings with physicians through the electronic medical record so they can contact patients before a problem escalates. Benchtop lab tests like flow cytometry use image technology to count cells. We have customized this optical sensor technology and miniaturized it in the port to count cells in vivo. We tested the Benchtop prototype with human and swine blood and trained the algorithm to recognize the cell images. We analyzed our findings and show a high correlation index compared to flow cytometry. Next, we're conducting animal models with swine to gather more data and to see how the device functions in a native vein. We've had several partnerships, investors, and we have a line of sight to our exit. I'm pleased to say that not only are we partnered with Mayo and Lucent Health, but we were recently accepted to Optum, uh, Optum Startup Studio that will allow us to take a deeper look into patient data and how insurance payers function and look at unit economics and our business model deeply. We've had the good fortune of raising money through friends and family, as well as a pre-seed round of funding that has allowed us to get through two proof of concepts and is positioning us for animal models, which we're executing this fall. We're also starting a round of seed raise where we're raising $4 million, and that will take us into 2023 and position us to get to our FDA submission and also start Next Gen Care. Looking to the future, we'll launch a full platform called NextGen Care. We're passionate about addressing the needs of cancer patients first, but we see a future opportunities in dialysis and cardio care, clinical research, as well as veterinary care. Our team has, is very strong. Dr. Welcher has decades of experience in cancer diagnostic and business leadership. Dr. Ali, our inventor, directs the design of our product line. And I've spent 10 years face-to-face -face with cancer patients and NextGen Port is my third startup in oncology. Our board rounds out our team as our industry leaders in medical device commercialization and regulatory affairs. Seeing the numbers, excuse, seeing, uh, I'm here to ask for three specific things. First, we're seeking members to join our scientific board. Second, we're building out our engineering team and looking for expertise in power distribution and optics and software. And finally, like all startups, we're looking for funding and we'll leverage those funds to conduct animal models as well as that will get us to FDA data we need and accelerate our pace to market. I'll pause now and I look forward to your questions. Kathy, thank you so much. Super exciting to learn about NextGen Port. It sounds like this could be a real game changer for not only the oncology space, but I'm assuming beyond that as well. I have a couple of questions while we're waiting uh, for additional questions from our audience, but can you talk about what differentiates you from other monitoring products on the market? Yeah, thank you, Katie. So we look at the competitive landscape. First, we have to ask why haven't port manufacturers done this before? And they, we've done our homework and port manufacturers see our, their device as a delivery tool, chemo in and blood out. And we've reimagined the port as a passive data collection device. We compete against wearables, um, but they have limited levels of patient engagement and adherence, and they don't measure blood counts. We compete against lab tests, which do measure blood counts, but require patients to drive to clinic, and that blood count measure is only one point in time. Great. Thank you for that. Um, my, my next question was actually about upcoming clinical trials, and one of our um, physicians in the audience asked the same thing. Has this been in any clinical trials already? And if not, what do you have planned as far as trials for the future? Um, so we are working on our first in-animal feasibility trial this fall, where we'll be um, using a sedated pig. Um, we're actually calling it the three little pig study because we're gonna take uh, time to put our product in uh, three different animals and see how it functions in a native vein. So that feasibility study, learning what we'll learn by putting the device in uh, live blood flow will then set us up for several grant applications, which we submitted that will build on those animal models where we'll actually implant the device in a swine for six to eight weeks. So we'll be gathering data from a, um, a device that's functionally implanted in a body and the animal will be walking around, 
doing what an animal does and we'll capture late live data from that scenario. So that's what our next animal model will look like. That is awesome. And just a clarification for our audience. Um, we had one question. This is essentially um, just like infusion ports that are on the market right now. The difference is this does monitoring ongoing for the patient as well. Is that correct? That's correct because we take, we're leveraging something that's existed for decades, the chemotherapy port that has reimbursement codes for surgical implant and removal, but we're making it smart by integrating it with microelectronics and optical sensors. Um, there's always been a, a, a significant footprint in the body of the port and we're leveraging that space with technology that frankly didn't exist 18 to 24 months ago and uh, bringing that to market to leverage something that has not been used to collect longitudinal data points in between chemotherapy. Um, and that is also gonna be a novel data package that includes vitals such as heart rate, body temperature, blood counts, and cardiac output. That's fantastic. And um, a couple of additional questions. Um, I'm assuming like other ports, this is something that's implanted in the hospital, but as you mentioned, this could be a game changer for at-home monitoring of these patients. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So because we're working with Mayo Clinic and meeting with an oncologist regularly, she's also the director of digital health at Mayo in Rochester, as well as sitting on the board of artificial intelligence. So she's helping us think more broadly about hospital at home and oncology at home. And so if you imagine if infusion is moving to the home care setting, how valuable would it be to manage costs, manage headcount, and get accurate data over time to have an implanted device that's keeping track of these important um, measures. That's fantastic. And I have to tell you, um, one of our oncologists in the audience has, well, and others, by the way, we have several other questions that we're not gonna have time for. So I will remind all of our guests that are joining us tonight, if we didn't get to your question, we really want you to stay for additional Q&A after all of our presentations. Um, we are, Again, super excited to be back and have this great audience tonight. Um, and again, Dr. Bandari is gonna, gonna grill you a little bit in, in the after session. So Perfect. Um, I think it'll be fantastic. Thank we you put so up, much. Yes, thank you. We put up the poll for Next Gen Port. Again, this information, um, we want everyone in our audience to answer the poll questions because this is feedback that we're gonna give back to our CEOs and our founders, um, and they really want your feedback. So Kathy, thank you so much. Um, fantastic, exciting technology to learn about. I am going to um, turn things over to my colleague, Mike Shemansky, who is gonna talk to us about the newly formatted SPVs. Well, um... <clears throat> This is going to be amusing, especially after that uh, introduction, but I wanted to let everybody know that big changes are afoot at Angel MD, and one of the biggest changes is we've become more organized. Uh, yes, you can appreciate the irony with that transition, folks, but yes, we are much more organized, and among those things, including things like Angel MD Pitch Club will be coming out once a month for now on the second Tuesdays of the month, but paired with it will be more events that occur during the course of the week including on Wednesdays, an investor roadshow focus. So it's an investor focus on Wednesdays. And on Thursdays, we'll be having additional educational events as sponsored by Angel MD Academy. That will include doctor roundtables, company-sponsored education events, eventually including uh, continuing education credits and other aspects of things that are going to be going on there, master classes and other offerings. Why do I talk about organization? Well, because the other thing that's happening is managed syndicates are a product that we've launched, and those investor nights are always held on Wednesdays. So tomorrow night, we have Hippo Health presenting as our first managed syndicate after this pitch club, and the week after that will be Alive Medical. Um, Alive is actually presenting tonight at Pitch Club. Uh, that's Avon's company. So you'll get a taste of their science side now. And if you want more information about them, you can attend their investor Q&A night on next Wednesday. 
Uh, we'll also be having institutional road shows that, that is are meant more for industry and large companies and brokers and things like that. If you do run or have contacts with family offices or larger networks and would like more information on the schedule of those events, please let me know and we'll have an ongoing conversation. What makes syndicates interesting? Well, for those people that may invest in public markets but haven't done the private market investment route yet, this is an important thing. Most people, if they are first getting into private investing, wonder about, like, what's the added reporting requirements, taxes, are there all added hoops to jump through, all the paperwork involved? We've streamlined that for you to a large degree. The other problem is often, and can I invest uh, my size? Like, I don't want to put $100,000 to a startup. I don't have that kind of liquidity. Managed syndicates allow you to access these companies with as little as $10,000 if you're an Angel MD member. Um, not all syndicates will go down to 10,000, but a lot of them were offering $10,000 minimums for Angel MD members. And the third aspect of investing in early stage companies is do I have the attention span or bandwidth to support these companies on an ongoing basis? At Angel MD, we very often like will tell you that the investment is just the beginning, that it's supporting the company after that investment that is critical to their long term success. That's the beauty of coming in on an angel MD managed syndicate. You're not only getting a vetted company that we are supporting on, like as a matter of our network, but you are receiving the backing of other clinician investors who are specialties in that field that are being actually even compensated for their long-term engagement with the company and to support them for their success in the future. So I don't want to take everybody's time up tonight and get into too many details, especially because I am want to go into lingo and, and go down a rabbit hole, so to speak. But we do have a series of blogs talking about managed syndicates. I highly uh, encourage you to engage with them. We'll be having additional educational evenings and other aspects of that. You can reach out to me at any time. And most importantly, say Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m. Mountain. Almost every Wednesday, we've got an amazing company that we're presenting for their investor Q&A, and we hope to see all of these guys eventually at those uh, evenings, and all of you at those evenings in the future. So with that, I will step back and hand it back to Katie. Thank you for your time, I, uh, and I will step back into the shadows here. Mike, thank you so much. Exciting time for Angel MD and those companies um, that are part of this managed syndicate program. A lot of exciting innovation and technology, I think. So definitely for those of you that are in our audience, join us um, for those events because they're gonna be really exciting as well. So our next um, pitch presenter is gonna be Yvonne Bokelman and she is the CEO of Alive Medical. Yvonne, thank you so much for being here tonight. We're gonna go ahead and roll your video and then we will have time for Q&A uh, as we did with Kathy once the video uh, has completed. Good evening, thanks for joining this evening. And I will stop for a moment to ask if you can hear, if you can hear what's playing. Yes, you got it. Excellent, Fantastic. I will go on and I will hand it back to you guys. And I apologize to the audience for this. Again, we do this specifically to try to smooth these technical difficulties. It's embarrassing that we've actually created one as a result, but here we go. I'm Yvonne Bachelman, CEO of Alive Medical. As a bit of a background, I'd like to share with you um, a story about our founder, my chief research officer. He's based in Italy and he has a long history in working with Formula One racing, including with Ferrari and Ducati and Lamborghini. He develops sensors and performance equipment, high tech and highly sophisticated products. He took that knowledge when he pivoted to orthopedics and subsequently developed the products that are now the foundation of Alive Medical. I have to admit, it's a pretty unique and pretty cool story. Alive Medical has two commercial products that are um, solving a few musculoskeletal problems. Number one, there has been no stimulation device that really uh, retrains the brain and achieves positive long-term outcomes. These devices do not provide stimulation that is dynamic, nor biofeedback, nor do they generate a neuroplastic response. Number two, in orthopedics, we're assessing those who do not comply with their physical therapy program as prescribed, and it costs orthopedic outcomes. Sorry about that, folks. I was trying to mute my own audio, and it inadvertently muted the video. Here, rewinding 30 seconds, starting again. My apologies. And it's pretty inconsistent and subjective. Think about on the right-hand side, evaluating your pain by using happy faces. 
Thirdly, compliance with PT is a documented problem. 75% of patients do not comply with their physical therapy program as prescribed, and it costs billions of dollars in added costs. And with the continued exponential growth of orthopedics, it demands efficient and effective care that can be delivered remotely. So we have two solutions for this. Our first solution is a therapeutic, substantially differentiated NMES, or neuromuscular electrical stimulation wearable device, called Neuroline System S, which treats about 90% of shoulder pathologies. It has a companion tablet that, along with the device, provides that biofeedback, increasing patient compliance. The key here, however, is the MAS, or motion activated stimulation, which provides dynamic interaction, inducing neuroplasticity with long term results. Our second product is Show Motion, and it's a diagnostic sensor kit. It is um, able to document both normal and abnormal movement and joint function in just about five minutes. It's non-invasive, it's mobile, and has instant graphic results. To provide a visual of sort of the problem and solution in action, I have two patient videos for you. The first one is a warehouse worker who uh, you will see has significant instability, and this will be his first time using uh, Neuroline System S. Let's take a look. This is kind of painful to watch. You can see the difficulty he has raising his arm. And then with Neuroline, he is immediately able to raise his arm, and you don't see uh, the instability that you saw in the first part of the video. The second patient is using our show motion device, and you can see here that she um, she is out of alignment with the green band of normality. Look at those pink and blue lines being outside that green band. We're going to see her um, activate with a uh, show motion on and then move to Neuroline S and see the difference. Again, it's marked where she has some instability. And again, look at that and look at the lines being right in that band of normality that she is using Neuroline. So we know that there's an extensive body of evidence that supports the efficacy of functional NMES, but with Neuroline System S, we've really taken it to a next level. First, the patented MAS, which number one, defines an algorithm that modulates the intensity of the stimulation, and number two, is dynamically controlled with the technology during the patient's individual movements. Multi-sensor input afferences amplify that neuroplastic effect. With show motion, we've gone beyond the standard motion tracking, and we have the ability to record and identify the motion patterns to which healthcare providers can correlate the pathologies and the necessary treatment. This product also has a proprietary algorithm that enhances and advances a number of pertinent features. Look, we know this work. There's ongoing feedback from patients and physicians, but let me share an example of a data point with you from an independent randomized controlled trial involving five study sites where patients were randomized to six weeks of physical therapy alone, sort of the typical standard of care, and then PT for six weeks using Neuroline System S. If you look at the top turquoise line, you can see the first arrow is when the six weeks of PT and Neuroline are stopped, and yet the performance continues to improve and carries on for 12 months, the duration of the study. You can see it's almost 100% change in the baseline improvement using the two product, using PT and the product together. On the orange line at the bottom, you see that there is PT alone. Again, on that first arrow at six weeks, you see um, the PT stopped and the patients begin to deteriorate, honestly, and then they sort of flatline across the next 12 months. What's different in this study is um, at that three-month time frame, their first opportunity to satisfy patients could cross over and then have six weeks of PT with Neuroline S. And the light blue line demonstrates where that happens. The second red arrow showing where that six weeks ends. And then you see again, that continued improvement in neuroplasticity and carried out for the 12 months. We have a number of other metrics and publications for the products, and I'm happy to share those on request. Further, there will be more publications forthcoming in the near term, including the full results of this randomized controlled trial. Our live medical story starts in about 2016 with the development of show motion and Neuroline S and the follow-up of the necessary clinical evidence. You can see from 2018 to the current time, we have gained our regulatory approval in Europe and the US. We've launched both products, show motion and Neuroline S in the US and in Europe. And 
about halfway through this year, we've shown that over 200 clinics globally. Hey, Mike, we're not seeing. Oh, there we go. Can we rewind a little bit? We were not seeing the video there for a little bit. You guys got me trying to like load the next videos. So sorry. The development of show motion could cross over and then have six weeks. Were we like, was the, were we looking at this is important? This You're fine. Out. Just leave it there. Okay. It's a PT with Neuroline S. And the light blue line demonstrates where that happens. The second red arrow showing where that six weeks ends. And then you see again, that continued improvement in neuroplasticity and carried out for the 12 months. We have a number of other metrics and publications for the products, and I'm happy to share those on request. Further, there will be more publications forthcoming in the near term, including the full results of this randomized controlled trial. Our live medical story starts in about 2016 with the development of show motion and Neuroline S and the follow-up of the necessary clinical evidence. You can see from 2018 to the current time, we have gained our regulatory approval in Europe and the US. We've launched both products, show motion and Neuroline S in the US and in Europe. And about halfway through this year, we've shown that over 200 clinics globally now are using Neuroline S. Over 2,500 patients have been treated and we have over 25,000 patients in the show motion database. So our traction is great. And if I lure you up to the top of the screen, you can see just a select group of uh, facilities that um, are using Neuroline S and show motion. And while the notoriety of these facilities alone is something that we're super proud of, but the fact that we've been able to gain access and have them using our products without having a sales force in the US speaking to the outcomes and the feedback. Um, obviously, adding a sales force requires funds, and if I slip uh, to the bottom of the screen, you can see we completed a friends and family round in May of this year. We've opened up a seed two, and we're about to launch a Series A, which will really allow us to grow and scale and build out the team that we need. In 23 and 24, we'll have the introduction of Neuroline Me and Neuroline Spy, Spine, both of which are being worked on right now. And then we see, frankly, an exit for ourselves with either um, large orthopedic or mature orthopedic or even sports or performance companies. We know all of these entities are looking for um, innovative technology and they're looking to own that continuum of care. And we obviously bring that to the table. I am really fortunate to be working with a um, great team that is covering the spectrum of experiences required to successfully execute on our vision which is changing that paradigm of musculoskeletal rehab and the standard of care around muscle and joint function. I wanna thank you for your time. My contact information is as noted. I'm happy to take questions and Katie, I'm turning it back to you. Thank you. Wonderful, Yvonne. So sorry for our technical difficulties. Thank you for your patience. Thank you to our audience for your patience. Um, I am super excited by what you guys are doing. And it seems like, Again, it will be amazing for orthopedists, for sports medicine physicians, for physical therapists, um, some products that really will advance all of those fields from a rehab perspective. So it's very exciting. I um, One of the things that I was thinking about, and again, if you have questions for Yvonne in a live, please put them in the Q&A. But I'm excited by all of your traction so far. That is really exciting. But you also mentioned the fact that this, this product and this system affects neuroplasticity. Talk more about that because again, that's amazing. Yeah, so it's key as you saw in the results from the randomized control trial that really when you work on that muscle brain retraining and activation, the improvement not only continues, but it is sustained for the long term. It's what we also describe, right? We've got biofeedback, but we're also feeding forward and training. This is what the body should be doing. This is how it should be performing. A little bit of a story. I was um, at a customer site. I was down at LSU with their sports team um, several weeks back, and we had a Neuroline S on a uh, softball player. And her comment as she went through some exercises and some demonstrations using the product was the fact that 
she said she always had PT, right? They have PT all the time. And her comment was, you know, a PT can sort of tell me what to do, but until I had this on and really felt what my muscle was supposed to do, I would have never gotten there. And so she quickly wanted to put it on the other arm so she could see what is she supposed to be? What is that scapular humeral rhythm uh, that's normal for her and what should that look like? So it, it's definitely... It's definitely something that is the connection and, and really important to our technology and how we move forward. Yeah, that's really exciting. And you mentioned actually um, sports teams. I would imagine that this, again, could be a game changer for high performance sports. Talk a little bit about that. You're right. We did have a little chat about that. It definitely has a place in sports as well. Think of using show motion, right? So you're gauging that abnormality or normality of musculature. So be able to gauge by doing a baseline muscle movement and function and then monitor regularly for any changes. It could be used for performance enhancement. It could be used potentially injury prevention. Um, Neuroline System S, of course, could be the therapeutic device in the armamentarium of, of treatments that the pay, that the the sports or the athlete uses, but in fact, it, neuroline system can also be used while doing the sport. Yeah, I want to hear a little bit more, and uh, we also had a question in the chat about potential distribution models. Um, talk, talk about what that looks like. Is it a subscription model or something else? It's something else today. Um, typically today, our interest comes from the orthopedic surgeon who wants this for his or her patients, whether they're treating dyskinesia or instability, rotator cuff repair, et cetera. And so they see it, they want it, they ask their facility or their physical therapy clinic to buy it. So predominantly it is a purchase of the device today used in the clinic setting or in the PT setting. We will be moving uh, this quarter, in fact, to a rental model as well to increase the access. It's something that we had a lot of patients request. And as you saw by the, the traction, we have major referral centers. So patients are going, having treatment, and then going perhaps to another town or another state. And so we need a model to continue um, helping them. So we're working, we're working on doing that rental model as well. Fantastic. Well, Yvonne, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And telling us all about Alive's products and the Neuroline S system. I know you're gonna have several questions uh, in the networking portion, specifically potentially one around how this could be used for golfers. And I gotta tell you, I've been working on my golf swing, so I, I'm gonna be there for that answer. Um, we wanna help you there. <laughs> yeah. Again, for those of you um, that are in our audience tonight, we have the opportunity to network with our presenters from 7 to 7.30 Mountain Time. So after all the pitches are done, please join us for that because if your question, if you didn't get your question answered in the Q&A, you have the ability to do that um, afterwards in our networking session. We and put I, up I just want to interject there, Katie, that you will find the link to the networking section in the chat box at the in the closing five minutes of this uh of this event here it's kind of like going next door for the drinks and apps after the event so just be aware there will be another link you need to click on in order to access that event sorry and please and we'll me we'll mention that again before we uh before we move there in the meantime um i know that yvonne and alive would love your feedback so we have our poll up please um take a moment to uh, answer the questions uh, that we have placed up there for them. Again, they really want this feedback and appreciate um, anything that they can get from all of you. So I'm going to, without further ado, because I know we are moving um, because of our technical issues a little bit slowly tonight, but we're going to go ahead and bring on our last presenter, uh, Max Sims, and Max is the co-founder and CEO of MindTrace. Hi, everyone. Perfect. Max Sims, and our team spun MindTrace out of Carnegie Mellon University because we are on a mission to protect the minds of neurosurgery patients. 400,000 Americans woke up this morning with medically refractory epilepsy. Uh, another 100,000 don't know it yet, but are going to be diagnosed with a brain tumor uh, sometime in the next 12 months. And for these individuals, there's a real restricted range of options for how to treat the disease. And oftentimes, uh, treating the disease requires making very difficult trade-offs. And unfortunately, for patients who pursue surgery, uh, as many as four and five will self-report a cognitive deficit after surgery that negatively impacts their quality of life. And so that is really the core challenge that motivated our team 
to develop the next generation of neurosurgical planning software tools. And really, we uh, like to give an example by using Dan the musician here. Uh, Dan's a saxophone player, unfortunately diagnosed with a brain tumor near the musical area of his brain. Uh, and brain surgery, right, is particularly scary because patients want to make sure they're going to be the same person, you know, keyword person coming out of surgery that they were going in. And so really the challenge for the neurosurgical team is to collect as much information about brain, about Dan's brain as possible uh, in order to find the best route and remove as much tumor as, as they can uh, versus potentially damaging nearby healthy brain tissue that could lead to other cognitive deficits like being unable to walk or talk, right? So in Dan's case, the surgical team uh, needs to protect his musical ability. But in order to protect it, you have to understand where that is anatomically and physically located within his brain. And all of us have the same general cognitive abilities in roughly the same location, but there is significant inter-individual variability between us, uh, often up to two centimeters. And that might not sound like a lot, uh, but keep in mind neurosurgery proceeds millimeter, millimeter by millimeter. So having really high resolution, temporal and spatial uh, resolution uh, is very important for, for these clinicians. And so my interest at the end of the day really mean keeping patients the same person, again, keyword person uh, they were before surgery. So what MindTrace is, uh, we're a clinical decision support tool or a software platform uh, that integrates standard of care and neuroimaging with behavioral measures uh, that are collected over the course of these patients' care. Uh, that data set serves as the foundation for leverage AI and machine learning to allow clinical teams to simulate these resection plans, right? Simulate uh, what tissue they are gonna have to go through or remove, uh, and then return a prediction as to the expected cognitive outcome for that particular patient. So really it's stratifying the risk uh, associated with, with different brain tissue. Um, we help quantify the trade-offs associated with different surgical interventions. And so uh, we try to provide this information uh, prior to surgery for, for surgical planning, but also in real time during surgery, uh, which is what you're, we're seeing here. Um, our platform has three distinct modules. The first one is really just a neuropsychological uh, data collection tool. Uh, the second is co-registering all these different neuroimaging data sets that are collected uh, as part of standard of care. And if you can collect data and you can co-register data, that's what serves for us as the foundation to continue developing module three, which is the surgical simulation and outcome prediction model, uh, leveraging AI and machine learning. So modules one and two are in early MVPs. Uh, this is from the University of Rochester, what you're seeing here. Uh, but we continue to work with our close clinical collaborators as we continue to, to develop this technology um, and, and commercialize this, this product. So what you're seeing here uh, is Dan being tested while he's awake during brain surgery. And you'll notice he, he makes an error there. Um, so again, we are just really facilitating a very specific test for these patients tailored to their brain uh, and their brain organization. And then we're able to adjust and collect all that information to help our patients right, by creating our AI these dashboards. So we spun out of Carnegie Mellon about two and a half years ago, uh, really uh, trying to take this technology that was helping 20 to 30 patients in the research context uh, and build into a product that takes what happens in the lab scale it into things that are going to happen in people's lives. Uh, and so for us, by building from very the beginning of the procedure and following these patients preoperatively, uh, intraoperatively, and postoperatively, we have been able to provide a resource to our surgical partners that they find valuable and, and trust us as a partner. Uh, and more than anything in our space, developing trust is really the, the, the biggest asset um, one can have when working with neurosurgeons and, and neurosurgery patients. So some technologies have problems with adoption hurdles. Um, in reality, we've sort of inverted that and, and have been working hand in hand with trusted clinical partners uh, and listening to them to help develop this technology moving forward. So we've kind of organically created our own user base um, as we continue to really build out the product, uh, even really before we have a final product. So uh, that being said, we have uh, been very successful with peer-reviewed publications. We have eight here, just a couple, uh, one from the University of Rochester and one that came out of um, this case I'm showing you. So again, we, we're always uh, open to, to, to new clinical uh, conversations and are looking to uh, be adding additional sites here in the, in the near future. So I mentioned Dan earlier, uh, he went through early versions of mind tracing and after personalized mind, uh, brain mapping, 
he was asked to play his saxophone while he was awake at the end of his resection to show that his musical ability was still intact. And so we recognize this as an extreme example, right? But it does show the level of personalized and precision medicine that MindTrace is trying to bring uh, to every neurosurgery patient. So you hear Dan played it beautifully, uh, and he's doing he's doing quite well. So uh, since kind of starting this journey, uh, we originally uh, originally received a lot of NIH and SF funding. So this was again done in an academic context. Went through the NSF I Corps National Program. Had the opportunity to travel around the country. Uh, at this point, to about thirty different medical centers, uh, and have a chance to speak with their clinical teams to really understand right what pain points are we solving by developing this technology. We have met with the FDA. Uh, we're putting the breakthrough device designation application here in November. Uh, and really, that's because we are going to be deploying an updated version of this platform at seven sites in Q2 of 2023, uh, five of which you can see there in the top right corner, uh, pretty well-known high-volume epilepsy and brain tumor sites that we're very excited to be working with clinicians there. Um, in order to, to do that, we have to fund it. Uh, and that's why we're uh, the last stage of closing our pre-seed round here. So our founding team, uh, we've all known each other for the last uh, really five years. Um, recognizing sort of our gaps, we've also really built up a, a trusted group of neurosurgeons whose voice we listen to as we continue to build out this product. Um, and then also we've built up a really trusted uh, group of business advisors who have had a track record of success in the med tech space that were very fortunate, um, but you know, stuck their necks out for us this early uh, in our development. So um, with that, Looking forward to taking your questions and thanks for your time. Wonderful. Max, thank you so much um, for being with us here and telling us all about MindTrace. Um, this is exciting technology. And, and as you mentioned, it's really about precision medicine and um, advances, or at least my understanding, advances in that arena. It sounds like you've had a, a lot of interest and traction from surgeons at research institutions um, around the country, actually, some big names, which is very exciting. Talk about, so, and I asked you this question early on, but talk about what keeps someone else from doing the same thing? Because I know there are, in, in surgery currently, they do some of these things already. So talk a little bit more about what differentiates you and what, what is going to keep someone else from doing the same thing. Yeah, and it's it's great to be here with all of you tonight. Um, so for us, uh, really the sort of data moat that we're building is probably our biggest uh, advantage relative to, to other competitors in the space. You're correct in that this, this is done uh, at the majority of high volume epilepsy and brain tumor centers. Uh, they are fortunate in that they have a lot of uh, personnel that they can sort of throw at these challenges. And, and yet a lot of this, this kind of data that's collected ends up being very siloed uh, for these patients. So we've really solved that sort of data integration problem um, at these sites and made their lives easier, which is why they trust us to, to, to work with them. So I think for us, you know, what ultimately differentiates MindTrace is there's a lot of great narrow navigation equipment out there, uh, and that can tell you anatomy. What it can't tell you is the implication of removing anatomy. And so for us, sort of serving as that glue uh, between these different data sets has allowed us to, to train these AI and machine learning algorithms in ways that other companies have been able to. Uh, we think the window is open in this space, and there will likely be other uh, entries uh, in, into this, which I, I take as a good sign. Um, but you are correct in that MindTrace is really trying to differentiate itself around the implications of removing brain anatomy. I think you're on mute, Dr. Richardson. Thank you so much. A similar question from one of our attendees um, around how do you meet criteria for breakthrough device designation? So does the device provide more effective treatment or diagnosis of some potentially life-threatening conditions? T talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we were fortunate. We did meet with the FDA uh, during a Q submission and the discussion around our breakthrough device application uh, was important. And for the FDA, um, and, and you would find this in our, our meeting minutes and their written feedback, is really the ability to predict outcome in patients. It's what's driving our breakthrough device application. Um, right now, you can talk to clinical teams. Uh, they collect a ton of data on these patients. And again, they're trying to protect function balanced against uh, you know, treating the disease. But if you often ask them, how did you measure, measure these patients after their surgery to know that all that time, energy, and effort went into protecting uh, who they are, you'll often find that they, they don't always follow these patients postoperatively. 
And so mind trace sort of closing that loop um, is what allows us to make better predictions of, of, of outcome for future patients. And that's what seems to be getting the FDA very excited. Wonderful. Thanks for that ex explanation. Um, tell us a little bit more. So it seems like most of what you have so far are, um, I want to say case studies or case reports. Are you planning future, I'm assuming you'll need to have future clinical studies, but talk a little bit about what those are going to look like. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're 100% correct. Um, we have done early versions of this in an academic context with about 150 patients across uh, the University of Rochester uh, and UPMC Medical Center. Um, that being said, we are also going to be rolling out an updated version of our platform uh, at seven centers in Q2 of 2023. And that's very important for us because it's going to allow us to collect uh, data prospectively on the same system across those different sites. And so we'll be developing about a, a data set of about 100 patients um, over the course of the next year and a half. That is what FDA has sort of told us they want to see um, as we're collecting preliminary data. Uh, and I think it's also important to make the distinction of sort of better prediction of outcome versus better outcome for patients. Um, ultimately, MindTrace does want to ultimately right, lead to better patient outcome. But the first step to getting there is being able to make better predictions uh, for a given surgical plan. And so that's sort of the initial FDA bar that we're going to clear, uh, which then allows us to move into that uh, other sort of, you know, ability to, to measure actual better patient outcome. Very good. Um, it's really exciting. And of course, um, it, uh, we want, we all want better outcomes for patients, I would say, but I understand um, the way that you uh, are thinking about this and moving forward. One last question. Can you talk a little bit about um, your go-to-market strategy? Sure. So I think for us, it's, very, it's been very uh, in, uh, intentional that we've been trying to work with sort of high volume brain tumor and epilepsy sites, because these are the voices that we want to be listening to as we continue to develop this product. Um, given the space that we're in, we think early adoption at these centers uh, is really what um, allows us to get publications, conference uh, discussions. And so for us, we've been very focused on sort of early deployment uh, and getting these physician champions to, to say good things about MindTrace, ultimately because they believe in the technology that we're, we're developing. So that's sort of the adoption side of the story. Um, and if you can get adoption in this space, we, we think the fundraising sort of comes quite naturally from that. That's wonderful. Well, Max, again, thank you for being here tonight. We really appreciate it and sharing your technology with us. Um, I'm sure there will be um, many folks that will want to come ask additional questions in our um, networking session. We have the That's poll perfect. Up. Thank you. Yeah. And I will thank just say you. one quick thing, uh, Dr. Richardson, which is uh, our chief science officer, Dr. Brad Mahone, will be joining for the networking session. So if you anyone would really like to get into the weeds of sort of the technical challenges we're solving, please uh, come see us there. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, again, our poll is up for MindTrace. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we would love for all of you to give feedback to Max um, and uh, MindTrace because they leverage this uh, feedback. While we're doing that, I'm going to include um, a few closing comments. Um, we're going to give a few announcements here about um, things that are coming up, but we want you to join us for networking with our speakers that will happen after this. As Mike mentioned previously, we're going to put a link in the chat. Once you click on that link, you will be asked if you want to close your current Zoom session and go to the new one. And you're going to say yes, because that's where we're going to have the ability to do breakout rooms and allow for ongoing networking with our presenters today. And if you had questions that didn't get answered in Q&A, this is where you're going to want to do it. It's very exciting. And I know our uh, all of our presenters are very eager to share, with, share more with you. Um, we will send an email out tomorrow, which will contain this recording, as well as any contact information and um, the links to the pitch videos. We encourage you to reach out if you're interested. Um, each of our presenters is going to have some asks of our AngelMD community. We encourage you to reach out to them um, and help support them, because clearly we had some great companies here tonight. 
We also have a LinkedIn group for Pitch Club. We would invite you to join that. Um, and we will load this entire program on our Angel MD website as well. Mike, did you have some parting comments for this evening as well? Just a couple. I uh, wanted to thank everyone for joining us on our first Pitch Club of the year. We had great attendance to kick off the fall season. We're happy about that. And that's including the fact that tonight is Yom Kippur, I believe. So we have high holy days and people are managing to come anyway. That's that's great. Um, for anyone that was not able to attend tonight or that has friends that wants the recording, as Katie mentioned, there will be recordings available. Thanks, everyone, and good night. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for joining us.